Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Metagame Book Club Track 1 Interactive Fiction. So today, as uh, we always have here, we have Sherry leading us on Track 1. We also have some other guests. Uh, Kay is here, uh, Leanne is here, and also Trish is here to, uh, to help uh, chat and uh, continue on our merry way as we talk about uh, the week one uh, presentation. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Sherry, and she can take it away. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So hi, hi again. This is Sherry Jones, and uh, you are indeed in track one, interactive fiction. So um, I've already heard about some um, worries about the amount of text that I assign each week. And remember, just, just as an emphasis, you are supposed to only select a few of them that you're interested in to, to read, so don't feel pressure that you have to read all of them, okay? Also, on my end, um, I was going to cover seven or eight texts, but I kind of gave that up. <laughs> <laughs> moderation, so for, moderation. <laughs> yes, yes. Good, good advice from Chris. So for for today, again, like we usually do, we have a specific focus on some of the featured text. Okay. So on this first page, um, what you're seeing right there, that's actually a screenshot or a GIF from Cipher Cyberpunk Text Adventure. This is actually one of the texts that I uh, assigned during my run of RG MOOC. So this is one of the texts that made students brain hurt, but it's an example of a modern version of what if games can go. Okay, so we can go next. All right, so moderation. <laughs> so I selected three texts under the history of interactive fiction section. Um, and the first one is by A History of Computer Game by Jasper Jewell. Second one is Storytelling and Computer Games, Past, Present, and Future by Dennis G. Jers. Um, interactive Fiction, How Is That Different? That's also from Jers. And then we have the Theories of Interactive Fiction section. So three tasks uh, selected. Uh, first one is called Gameplay Gestalt, Narrative and Interactive Storytelling by Craig A. Lindley. Second one is Generating Narrative Variation in Interactive Fiction by Nick Montfort. And Nick Montfort's a very big name in uh, IF research right now. And, and the third one is From Narrative Games to Playable Stories Toward a Poetics of Interactive Narrative by Marie Lore Ryan. Um, for those who have taken uh, track one in the previous uh, run, um, you might recognize Marie Lore Ryan. She's a prominent scholar in narratology. She talked about the difference between narrative, narrativity, and narration extensively. So these are the six texts that we'll focus on today. So next. All right. So I put down some guiding questions, um, and they're just there to help you think about the text as I'm explaining it to you, okay? So first is, what exactly is interactive fiction? That's our number one question, okay? Second is, how many if titles have you played, if you played any, okay? And another question which you will get from the text is, why shouldn't we consider all if works as games, okay? So there's a strong suggestion that some of them do not really qualify as games. Third one is, according to Jasper Jewell, why is computer authorship of interactive fiction a problem? So current research, current scholarship is going toward the idea of using artificial intelligence to generate narrative. And there are really big controversies with that generation right now. The fourth one is, according to Nick Monfort, what is the difference between content plane and expression plane in interactive fiction? So. Nick Monfort does a wonderful job using computational linguistics to understand interactive fiction. His, his dissertation is by far one of my favorite readings on this topic. So we'll discuss how he dissect interactive fiction into these uh, narrative parts using narratology. Okay? And the last question is, what exactly is narrative architecture and how does one create a narrative design? All right, so that's it. So please go next. All right, so here's that first one, uh, History of Computer Game by Jesper Jewell. Now, I have to ask our, our panel uh, speakers here. Um, has anyone played Zork? No, but I, I saw it on the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is part of popular culture now, right? 
Yeah, so but 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 we if you use the Big Bang Theory reference, it seems like only nerds play it and yeah. <laughs> this is uh Zork is an example of a parser based game, okay? So at the earliest version of ifs, okay? Um what you have to do is you you type in uh text into parser command. So it's not as if you're using a mouse to select options. What you're doing is you're figuring out what kind of words would the computer take. And there are limited commands that you can do, and that's how you progress in the game. So those are called parser-based parser games. Okay? That's where I get confused because it'll say, to the north is this, to the west is this, to the east is this, and then I get completely lost, and I'm usually just running through all four directions until they let me go somewhere. <laughs> well, that's one strategy. <laughs> I, I've done that too. Um, and also, you know, another uh, scary part is there is a concordance of vocabulary that you would have to know to play if games, right? Especially the parser based one. Um, so, this is just a sneak peek of what we're doing. Uh, uh, week two that's coming up, we are focusing deeply into narratology. Um, that asks if you can't get enough of it, right? So, we're going to go into that. And then the third week, I will give you guys some tutorials and also uh, the concordance of words that you can actually use to play through these if games so it's not as painful as you start out by yourself. Okay, so that's third week. Um, and, and, and Sherry, yeah. I was just going to say, um, the week two, even though we're focusing on the multiplayer classroom, we are talking about what's the narrative, what's the backstory, how how are you going to take these, uh, you know, game mechanics and and put them into your class. So what you're doing here, even though you're doing it, you know, even even if you're gearing it towards IF. Um, us learning more about the narrative really helps us um, with track two with the multiplayer classroom. Awesome. Yeah, we sync. That's great. Um, so let's see how that played back to back. That, that would be very interesting. <laughs> um, so I can go next from here. All right, so first part. Um, Jesper Jewell started his short article here. And this article is actually part of his dissertation, okay? But I took one piece of it because his dissertation is really long and it's really wonderful to read. Um, but he started off with a, a discussion of the history of computers. So he says here, some theories will claim that technology determines culture. Some will claim that culture determines technology. It may be most Reasonable to see this as a history of mutual influences where technology can inspire or enable cultural developments and cultural developments can inspire new technology. So you think about this beginning part where we talk about Housinga who claims that all cultures begun with uh, play, pedia, and ludus, right? You're, you're playing games. So games are where social groups come together think about possibility, invent new rules, and this is how civilizations are built, okay? So you see how Jesper Jill is not really going back to housing, uh, but he's also saying that the, the beginning of computer culture really is where culture influences technology and technology influences culture. And he gives us an example here. He says, the computer game was originally developed on equipment designed for military and academic purposes. But today the computer game is the driving force in the development of much hardware such as third graphics accelerators. So I don't know if anyone has been um, paying attention to what's happening, for example, in game criticism and literature out there uh, in current popular culture, where the big biggest discussion right now is about politics, political messages in games, right? But if we take a look at the beginning, how computer games came about, it was never apolitical. So apolitical means not political, right? It always started out with a certain amount of politics in there. We just forgot the history of computer games, so we divorced it from the political uh, heritage that computer games come about, okay? So if we can go next. All right, so here is a definition of interactive fiction that Jewel offers to us. And throughout this presentation, you'll hear several definitions, but we're starting off with Jewel's, okay? So he says, interactive fiction was never defined theoretically, and the theorist Aspen Irseth um, rejects it completely as pure connotation without any real meanings. So they're both, Irseth and Jewel are both allergic to <laughs> the term 
interactive fiction. Okay? Allergic? <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, they're kind of allergic. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so here's, his, here, here's his justification, okay? He says, I think this is basically correct, and here's the, the, the uh, bold part. We lack a theoretical definition. The term is basically used to claim literary qualities for a game. But the basic image of interactive fiction is as simple as it sounds. It is the image of a fictive world, fiction taken to mean narrative, a world to interact with, to participate in. So you see where his emphasis is. He's saying that basically IF works are basically spatial constructions, but we mistake in the spatial construction to be literature. So Jasper you'll see literature at a higher complexity that IF is not offering yet. Okay, so keep in mind that he wrote his dissertation in 2001 when IF works are still spatially dominated. It hasn't progressed as far as we see it now. Okay, so if we can go next. All right, so here's his further criticism, okay? <laughs> so, utopia of interactive fiction. So here's another quote here. He says, interactive fiction has from the very beginning been defined in opposition to other types of computer games. But later on, many games have been promoted as more interactive fictions than other games with the same label. In actuality, the products labeled interactive fiction have not developed much on a structural level. They haven't become more complex or dynamic. The primary development has rather been a move from text-based games to games based on graphics. Interactive fiction is then two things, a utopian idea and a genre continually claiming to have created this utopia. So here are some important concepts, okay? So first he's saying, well, it hasn't changed much. This is his biggest complaint, is that the literary uh, elements hasn't really been translated or added into if. The other issue is uh, what you see here is that um, the utopian vision, right? If is supposed to deliver literary level work to the masses, but he is saying it's utopian because it's still structured in a spatial format. It hasn't progressed from that. So he calls if a genre. So if you guys think of the if as genre instead of associated with an object, the rest of the reading will make a lot more sense. He's saying that it's basically, genre is a structure, right? It's a set of conventions to structure what we call something. For example, if you say this is a, a detective novel, there are certain elements to that book that makes it fall into the detective genre, right? So same thing with if, think of it as a genre rather than an object, then the rest of the reading will make more sense. Okay, so if we can go next. All right, so here's an issue with this idea of computer as author. So he says here, American dra dramaturgist and computer theorist Brenda Laurel uh, proposes a system for generating well-formed plots as defined by Aristotle in his Poetics. In this proposed system, the computer program must take on the role as author while the game progresses. Any action by the player uh, must lead to the system adapting the fictive world so as to make sure every story is well-formed. Uh, so if you haven't read Aristotle's Poetics, okay? <laughs> In that particular book, Aristotle talk about how to form plot. Now when we say if you're outside of English discipline, if you haven't thought about the different story and plot, story is the entire, you know, the narrative construct, right? So it has the content and the organization and everything else. But plot refers to the actual sequential organization of the story. And usually when we think of a plot, we're talking about chronological sequence or time sequence. So you're saying scene one, this is what happens, scene two, this is what happens, scene three, this is what happens. That's what we mean by plot, okay? And Aristotle in his poetics talk about the three parts of plot, which you have a clear beginning, middle, and end. So he says this is how you do plot, it is a linear progression. So we're hearkening back all the way to poetics, okay? So I'm gonna move forward from here. All right, so here's the problem. <laughs> so we talked about the first introducing the idea, and now here's the problem. So Jewel um, references uh, Janet H. Murray, um, who, who wrote uh, Hamlet on the holodeck, the famous book uh, on, about the holodeck here. And she says that such work, such as if, has to move from simple structure of forking paths to more flexible systems capable of adapting to the actions of the player. So I'm going to stop right there before I continue. 
the forking paths, okay? So, so uh, the idea is when you're um, um, Luis uh, Borges, right? He taught. There's a book called The Garden of Forking Paths. But essentially, you when you progress in the story, you come across several options. So those are paths that you have to take, and they fork. So every decision that you make take you to a different ending, right? So that's the forking path. But Murray is saying that's really not enough if we're going to take if to a utopic vision, right? If it's just forking paths, that's really too basic. She is saying that the game itself had to adapt to the action of the player. So the game actually had to interpret what the player is doing and then change the game world, the story, to fit what the player is doing. This is the utopic vision of what ifs are supposed to do, okay? And then she says, or, or Je Jewel actually responded, he says, the problem is that this presupposes that it is at all possible to teach a computer rules for the generation of stories, which again presupposes that one is aware of what a story is in the first place. Aristotle has provided a static and normative framework for this in the poetics, but in narratology, nothing suggests that the work is done in any way. So, wow, this is, this is a mouthful, okay? Narratology is the study of narrative. How do you construct a narrative? How do you structure a narrative? And the truth is, if you talk to a narratologist, it takes years and years and years to understand what a narrative is doing. Also, it's not one set of rules. There are many different types of narrative forms, and there are different rules associated with each form. So to suggest that we can program a computer to understand all the rules of a story is problematic. Um, it's not impossible, but at current time, there's really nothing that is helping the computer generate, you know, uh, a narrative that actually what literary scholars say, yes, this is a narrative, okay? So if anyone has questions, just cut in and, and, and stop me. Um, but if there's no question, I'll keep going. Oh, do you have a question? Uh, it wasn't really a question. I'm just I'm I come from a slightly different tradition, and I'm thinking of Louise Rosenblatt and the idea of reader response theory, right. and and that's what keeps echoing around in my head that even if it's not that in reader response theory, the text is not static. Uh, the reader always brings to them to the text, their own interpretations, their own understandings. Um, and if you get to Bakhtin, uh, he also talks about the problem of simple language, defining terms. Right. So I don't think that IF is unique in the idea that um, the reader has a role in the narrative, in the development of story, but it's certainly taking it to a very different level. Right. And um, thank you for bringing up Rosenblatt's uh, um, uh, re uh, reader response theory. And it, it's especially his theory is more on the, the semiotic or actually, uh, yeah, the symbolic uh, si sign level. Okay, so semiotic sign level where the reader is making interpretation of the text. And in that interpretation, you're altering the story in that sense in your own way. But what's particularly unique about IF and which is the utopic vision is that it is trying to not just letting you interpret the text but also changing the game world so that it actually further influence your interpretation or aligns with how you want to interpret it. That was what they were trying to say but I certainly understand what you mean by the reader response which is when we are interpreting we're changing the story for our own benefits and also when you talk about definition which is the connotation of words uh, the way we interpret things is also based on our own context right so the meaning of a text also you know changes as our connotation is different so again going back to the discussion here they're basically saying that an if work the utopic vision one is where it actually changes context according to what the reader wants which is you know, again, this is kind of a fantasy right now because artificial intelligence can't really read your context yet. It doesn't even have its own context. So that's what the scholars are trying to figure out. Um, but certainly it is definitely associated with what you were, the, the theories that you're talking about. Okay. So if I, if I may, I can go next. Okay. 
So we kind of, uh, that, that was a short text. Now I'm going to go into the second one. The second one, actually there are two texts that I uh, put together. Both of them are by uh, uh, Dennis G. Gers. First one is Storytelling, Computer Games, Past, Present, and Future. And the second one is Interactive Fiction. How is it different? Okay. Now, I don't uh, who who has played Mist? I watched my nephew play it. <laughs> <laughs> no one else played. No one else played Mist. I haven't played. I know. I here's the thing. Most of the people I know have played Mist and love Mist and and you know and and you know pine over Mist and talk about what Mist was like and so I I mean I've heard a lot about it but I've not played it. I've started oh, playing it. Um, it's on the iPad. I got oh. the, I got the version that's on the iPad based upon what I had read this week, and so I've just started it. Um, and I'm just very, trying very to figure good. out how to move around in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, this seems to be an ongoing theme with me of being able to move around in interactive fiction. Right <laughs> now, this is the beginning. You know, Miss is where you know it. it it's kind of continuing on the part, uh, the tradition of the parser-based games, which is all text. But what they did was, Miss was uh, categorized as an adventure game, right? But adventure game really are also is because what they did was they just overlay graphics. So instead of saying a mountain is to the west of you, they actually drew out the mountain. And when you're directing, you're using mouse clicks to kind of move around the the spatial environment. Um, but again, it's still a, a if version. And keep in mind as you're playing, it's really just one giant slideshow. <laughs> 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 Except you have a sense, you illusion of, of uh, uh, going left, right, you know, east, south, whatever. So again, I was hoping someone recognized it, but good for you for for starting to play because this is one of my my favorite games as starting out. Okay. So. Not, and, and then you'll see the fissure. When you start playing, I don't know if you saw the intro, but there's that awesome fissure where the guy fell into it. Okay. All right. I'll, call, I'll stop talking about this. Let's move forward. Okay. So here's, here's the proposition here, that if is a challenge to authority. Okay. So let me explain this part. So Jerks uh, references back to Poe's modernist scholar Linda Hutchian. Um, who noted that uh, what she called a dethroning of suspect authority and also renewed aesthetic and theoretical interest in the interactive powers involved in the production and reception of text. So funny enough, her this 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 post honor scholar's quote here actually counters against what Rosenblatt's uh, uh, reader response there. So it's kind of fun to see these arguments. But um, postmodern scholars. Uh, you know, postmodernism is a question. Part of postmodernism is a question of truth, right? What exactly is truth? Is there this universal truth? Now, there is the sus woman say suspect of authority. When you write a book, okay, and when the reader reads this book, you become an author or another term for you know root word for the word authority. So, what exactly is th authoritative about that narrative? The way you write that story follows your logical thinking, right? So when someone reads your text, they are forced to follow your logical thinking. Now, if they interpret on a semiotic level, which is sign, signify or signified, okay, they can still interpret it to say, I think this text means this, the definition of word means that. But still, they are forced and tethered to the structure of the way you lay out that narrative. And again, just because you write a book does not make you an author or authority. But somehow we, you know, as readers, when we read a text, we tend to align, we tend to think that the person who wrote the book is the authority on the matter. This is where the postmodern scholars say, you know, we suspect this. There is a problem with books themselves. They impose a type of authority, and we don't recognize this, okay? Now, <laughs> I'm just laughing because of all the fan fiction. And, and I know Leanne has also had discussions what, with other researchers about the value of... of of fan fiction when it comes to writing. And Leanne, you want to say something about that? Well, um, I'm just wrapping my brain around all this. I'm really new to interactive fiction and it's making me think very differently about 
um, conceptions of narrative and conceptions of literature. I think it really is a significant change in the idea of authorship. That, if I understand correctly, what the premise is that you no longer have a, a single author or a group of authors that have. Uh, set the words down, it becomes a collaboration between reader and author. Am I getting yes. it? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. We're all doing the same work, so yes, awesome. Very nicely put. <laughs> so, and so thanks, Kay, for bringing up fan fiction, because fan fiction is also for, for scholars, you know, they, they interpret it as an attempt to usurp authority, right? And also the fan fiction is really the logic of the fan. The fan saying, this is how I see things should go. This is how I think the story should progress and the plot should continue. So in a sense, it's also a usurpation. But you know the paradoxes, right? When we read fan fiction, that is still an authority in their sense of authority. We just need to understand that those are perspectives. And I mean, we're, we're looking at that more and more. Um, for for ISTE, for Machinima this year, Leanne's joining us. And one of our categories for Machinima is fan fiction. And, and you all know how we already want to try and get you for when ISTE comes to Denver next year uh. in 2016 <laughs> because you might be, you know, like geographically located near it. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and how we'd like to see if we could get maybe uh, and you know, an IF showcase. You know, we might not have enough for, you know, a, an IF festival, but, you know, maybe an IF showcase attached with our Machinima Fest. Well, I can't escape, so I think I'll be there. <laughs> 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 so, yes, that's very exciting. Um, so, 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 so yes. uh, one, one of the things, I, I keep on going back to this fan fiction, and one of the controversies within fan fiction has been the idea of, plagiarism, mm. that um, fan fiction writers, um, some people consider them suspect. I don't. I, I think it's actually pastiche and um, a recognized literary genre, but the original authors are having very interesting reactions. Some of the authors whose works become the center, the beginning point on fan fiction really rejoice in the kinds of engagements that their fans are offering to the reading community, and then there are others who are just appalled by the whole idea that somebody would dare to take their original work and build from it. And I just, um, I think the IF really is the author, the original author, taking it to the furthest point and saying, "I want my readers to be part of the authorship." which is a, a very different voice within writing. And mm -hmm. Leanne, I think you're so right because, I mean, I know just, you know, I, I haven't done if, but as far as, as designing, say, games in Second Life or, or designing ARGs, I absolutely want people to play it. You know, that's it. It's not that I just want them to read what cool story I've done. I want I want them to play it. I, I want to, I want to hear background. You know, I want I want to hear the results. I, I I just want to get into it much more than that. And you're right. Maybe that is a way for an author to be to you know to interact more with the people who are reading it or the fans or the players. That that if you know if would really give that to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This it's interesting that we're we're discussing, you know, that the problem with plagiarism. I don't have a problem with it unless if it's one to one, you know. <laughs> you take the author's work and you stamp your name on it and go, yeah, that's mine. You know, that's that's the the disgusting plagiarism, you know. But if you're saying, for example, Nick Montfort also discusses this, and this is he in his text that we're covering later. He borrows a lot from narratology, all, all the principles of narratology to in his dissertation. But there is he he uh, I like the fact that he separates this out, harking back to narratology, which is there's a difference between a content plane and an expression plane. So there are two tiers to a narrative. So the author, the original author, you know, they have the content plane, 
So when you are taking stuff from their work, you know, which is their original content, okay, but then the reader or the the the, the fan fiction or artists are basically rewriting it. They're adding another layer of expression playing onto it. So in that sense, it becomes a new original work, even if it was based off of an original text from someone else. So it is it is controversial, but if the authors can understand, or if we have a sit down with them and go, <laughs> there's a difference that content playing and an expression playing, and you should be happy that someone's adding onto that expression playing to make it a new thing. And also the fact that it, you know if if it's a famous work, people will always know where it came from, right? That in that sense is flattery. But it, go ahead. Well, no, it's uh, there are how many plots? Seven. <laughs> I, you've got seven stories to tell in the world, and, and, and to some degree, you have to just, you know, play off of those basic narrative lines anyway. Oh, there's a controversy too about that seven. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's why I was hesitant actually saying seven. So. Oh, that's okay. Next week, <laughs> guess what? We'll be looking at narrative patterns. That's what. That's my little and goal. And I was going to say that would be that is something, Leanne. If you have a link to anything, even if it's you know if it's a pro and con on the seven, that would be something really cool to to put up into our metagame book club. Because I'm sorry to say, but that's a quick look for for track number two. <laughs> you know, <laughs> track number two. Okay, you're going to do this quest line here. You only got seven stories. Just take one. Throw a dart. Right. Right. No, no. We, we, we need to see those. I, I want to see those. And this is why, you know, scholarship is a nice conversation between people, right? I mean, we, we might fight about certain concepts, but I we, we want to see these things. And going back, you know, we, we talked about um, Joseph Campbell, last last um, track, or I mean, last yeah. session, mm -hmm. Blue Barker helped us cover and a wonderful overview of uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, right? And it's based off of Ewanian theory. And also K, sorry, K, <laughs> you covered it. <laughs> sorry. Um, but again, yeah, Blue has done has done different ones for us. And right. and I know, yeah. Go ahead, Blue. Go ahead, please. So, <laughs> yes, both of you done a fantastic job, you know, digging into it. But that is just one of possible mm -hmm. narrative pattern. You know, there's many, many, many different patterns, and if is a challenge also to narrative yeah. pattern. Yes, as we will see as as we progress through this. Discussion. No, I and I and I think that that's really cool. And the reason and and I will I will tell everyone as a scholar, Sherry was going, but Kay, um, you're, what you're presenting is like she said, only one. And last time we we did the book club, we just did want to get Joseph Campbell out there because of uh, of the amount of teachers who were looking at developing quest lines. And they were basing it off the hero's journey. We really yeah. wanted to make sure people had a background on what the hero's journey was, and, and that's really why we picked that. That's why we're so glad you're you're taking us much further now. Well, thank you. And also, it, it wasn't exactly easy. It's it's a starting place. It's not like oh, there's something bad about it. It's a good starting place. Just that if you want to hurt your brain, there's a lot of other narrative patterns that we can discuss. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and there's one thing we want to do is hurt our brains and our students' brains, okay? Yay! <laughs> so I'm going to get away from this slide of this authority because it aches me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So here's the little juror's criticism, his rant, okay? He is talking about the rudimentary plot in game design, so this is his little beef. He says, modern designers of games do generally supply a rudimentary plot thread, something like a quest or personal vendetta, a story that contextualizes the battle sequences or arcade sequences. But programmers, here's my English professor bias coming through, <laughs> programmers who invest energy in things like real-time lightning, uh, lighting and fog effects in rendering the behavior of fire or droplets of blood rarely end up with stories of any lasting value. Oh, okay. So. Uh, disagree there. <laughs> hey, hey, 2001. 2001. Um, and I, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, why don't you add? Well, yeah, I guess, it's, and this has gone back to things I've said before, um, yeah. but I will tell you, the fog and the bloodiness and the lighting and, and stuff like that, uh, you know, straight out of us doing the Tibetan Book of the Dead, we had all of those things. 
yet. <laughs> we really, we really, we really felt like we had more than a rudimentary plot <laughs> going through that. And right. I, and I would say this is a 2001. I think that um, video games have developed since then. I think the narratives have developed, the stories, that the way that, that you create a whole universe now instead of just, you know, just considering the battle. I think right. that there has been a, a develop. I think we've evolved, and I'm really happy that we probably evolved. Well, and I'm yes. going to ask Sherry, I, when I think about the whole idea of the graphics uh, in gaming and games, I, I accept it just as an alternative way to establish setting and tone. And okay. I think it's I think it's important. I, as I play games, I think that the graphics make a significant contribution to the uh, certainly the tone and also the uh, settings. Wow, good question, by the way, and good comments. Um, that's another controversy. Um, <laughs> I want to hear those things. That's awesome. Um, Rafe Coaster. So, so, so Kay and I both read up on, you know, Rafe Coaster. So oh, that. yeah, and follow his tweets. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's a very prolific game designer, and, and I love his writing, okay? But one of the controversies that he references and is currently in the game design community, okay, is the complaint that, and also digital humanities professors been talking about this, which is there is a dictatorship or hegemony of, of, of graphics, of visuals, which is when we look at text, and we talked about uh, a multimodal text being five, I'm um, going all over the place, but there's five semiotic layers to a text. So you have the linguistic text, which is what you see on the screen right now. Okay, so you have the alphabets and you have sentences. You have the visual, which is the graphic, okay, so the images and whatnot. The auditory, which is uh, uh, audio, gestural, which is the movement of the body and expression of language, and spatial, which is relationship of things to each other in space. Out of those five semiotic possibilities of a text, um, it's been a big criticism that somehow the visual dominate all the other other four. So when we look at visuals, it dominates it dominates what the text meaning is, and there is this you know this is why everything is visual. Now, in the game design community, they say, you know what, back in the day, and they talk all the way back to if game parser based version of if, they said, you know what, those games were the best games because if I say there's a mountain to the west side, right, of you, you can use your imagination, that reader response theory coming in the end, which is you can use your imagination to fill in the blank. You can imagine what that mountain is like. But when you have a visual like an image, it dominates your purview. It, it forces you to kind of have to follow what the game designer said, this is what the mountain looks like. So they're really annoyed by that. Also, game designers said, <laughs> <laughs> see, this is why it's fun. Then now they're saying, well, you know what? The best, what the game development studios, especially the AAA ones think, if you improve the graphic, if you just make the best graphic ever, it will make the game good. But they're saying, no, not really. You can make the most beautiful, you know, rendering of whatever. But still, there are still problems with narrative. There's still problems with innovation. It's just the same game design over and over again, and they're sick of it. So anyway, that was just a little background. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I, yeah, I, I would go, I can... I can so I can so agree with that. You can have have lovely graphics, but horrible, boring play. Yes. You see how I go off on tangents, so I'm sorry. But uh, when you yeah. have people, um, it's kind of like the idea. I, what I'm hearing here is, well, things were a lot better when we just used rotary dial phones. Then we didn't have all these <laughs> this or that or the other. It. It's 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 a kind of a kind of an elitism snobism I guess against new things because they see the the parser as the pure form and that being so therefore since it was since it was the original and it was the pure therefore it is the best and so they there's kind of a, an elitist attitude towards the the graphics that you're talking about. Right. 
Now, to kind of, and I do want to defend Coaster on this. Um, what he is really doing, though, when he was talking about it, and it, and it definitely can read off as an elitist attitude, right? With a, and a perfect example with a rotary phone. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I want to defend him a little bit. He's really basically calling us to the attention that graphics isn't everything. That even though we, when we look at text, that the visual dominates what we want to see, the meaning of the world is dominated by visuals. He is saying the responsibility of game designers is to really also examine how you construct a narrative, how you construct mechanics, how do those narrative and mechanics work together, rather than just think about the best rendering a graphic. So that's just kind of a defense for, for Coaster. He's not really just saying, let's go back to, you know, the 19-whatever, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go there. I mean, that's, you know. But yeah, the, it's just a cautionary kind of asking call to action, which is, let's make games better. Let's not redo the same thing over and over again. Okay. With shinier package, let's say. So, uh, next. All right. Okay, so so jurors wanted to help people understand what the heck is an F, right? So he started to kind of explain a little series of what it is not. So first of all, he's saying that if is not a conversation tree. So he says, a conversation tree presents a player with a list of possible conversation topics or dialogue. Such trees explicitly displace all the options currently available to the, play, or to the user, whether those choices are sprinkled throughout the text or collected into a single multiple choice question. The classic if interface, by contrast, requires the user to intuit, deduce, or otherwise stumble upon alternative actions. Okay, so he's using this intuit and deduce. You see, there's some logic and in interpretation happening uh, in an if interface that a, a conversation tree would not have. So it's, you know, you're just following conversation, following the tree. So um, next, okay, so. Second, it's not hypertext fiction or hypertext narrative, so let's explain that difference, right? So he's saying most serious hyperfiction does not phrase narrative choices in simplistic terms that controls the outcome. So click here if the monster hugs the stranger, click here if the monster attacks the stranger. Um, but rather in controlling the reader's perspective on the story. So again, you see the tension, which is hypertext controls what the reader gets to see, right? So it controls how you go through it. Um, Hypertef narrative is in this sense more passive than if, okay? Since the reader is still simply clicking on links. Because all the decisions are made and you're just clicking and following through the linear storyline. But richer than ordinary tree fiction, since the reader doesn't always know what will happen when he or she clicks a particular link. Okay? So that's a nice distinction there. Um, next. And and I think that we oh, see it in okay. MMOs and some of some of the quest lines that we do in MMOs. It's not that we have any possibility and we stumble across it, but sometimes when, when we're when we are interacting with the, the non-player characters, we get you know the option to hug him or attack him. We right. see that a lot. Right. Um. Yeah. So I'm going to. Going to this next part as well. So let me let me one second. Okay. So, all right. So if it's not a moo, not a mud, or not a mush. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> no moo, no mud, no mush. No mush. Okay. okay. So sounds sounds like I, a sequel statement. <laughs> yeah. I know Kay and Chris both know this, but you know the the M U D right. Multiplayer uh, underground dungeon, right? Or user dungeon, sorry. Multiplayer user dungeon, right? So that's that's what it stands for. And moo, the two O's and moo actually is mud O O. So O O means uh, uh, object oriented programming. So that's what it's referring to. Essentially, I can't go into the programming part, but yes, the the interactive fiction usually uses object oriented programming, which you can take pieces of the programming and apply to elsewhere. Whatever. So and uh, uh, mush. Oh goodness, I'm 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 uh, spacing out for a second. So maybe I'll make Chris find it for me. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me read this little part. Yeah, I'm, my brain's all over the place. But um, if it takes place in a single user textual environment, which resembles a depopulated moo. Okay, shared virtual environments rely heavily upon improvised interaction between the visitors. Hence, moves rarely involve complex puzzles or any sort of dominant plot. Muds and moves rely upon interaction between user to provide depth. If, on the other hand, 
chance to rely less on interaction with simulated people, all of whom are controlled by the computer, and more on puzzles that rely upon simulated physical environments, a sprawling cave, a hedge uh, maze, or objects, a locked door, a rickety bridge, a hostile animal. So he is really talking about the beginning of If. The modern version of If is not just puzzles now, okay? But in the past version of If, especially when we talk about Parser, they really are puzzle games. You know, they're really not about connecting with other characters or understanding personality of characters. You're just trying to help figure out how to solve the puzzle. And much thank you. Yes, Chris, yeah, thank you. I always forget that one. Multi-user shared hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly, I, right? I That's like that magic here. circle. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, what were we saying, Ken? Uh, also the... Oh. Also, the H could stand for hack or uh, habitat or holodeck. Uh, Kay said she has uh, she has it up from Wikipedia. So okay. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. so. <laughs> H is, is apparently ubiquitous. You can use H for a lot of things. Yeah. The the very the very first one though. I, I my favorite is that hallucination. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm actually in a cave, and they're actually dwarfs, and they're actually monstrous. You know, you're, you're hallucinating. Um, <laughs> it's, it harkens back to the magic circle, right, by Halzinga, which is in a pretend space, which is safe for you to play, and you create your own rules, so you create your own fantasy, right? So that's kind of, you know, but except, you know, multi. it's a nice way of saying magic circle with mush, I guess. So anyway, that's the distinction, okay? So if uh, there's no similar people, it's puzzles. So I'm going to go next. Thank you. Okay. Now, hopping along. <laughs> Spending a little time today. Um, I don't know if we can cover all of them, but we'll just go as far as we can, okay? So the third reading is Gameplay Gestalt, Narrative and Interactive Storytelling by Craig A. Lindley. So Gestalt, the term Gestalt, the author is borrowing from Gestalt psychology, okay? So I'll explain that in a little bit. It's a little confusing, but... Uh, and also, oh yeah, I forgot to explain. This is a shot from the game Facade. Now I'm going to let it loop again to the beginning. Well, it's a little slow. Okay, but anyway, this does it, has anyone played this game before? No. <laughs> okay. It doesn't look anything impressive now because it's an older game, but if you saw on the screen it says, Grace, do you love me, right? That's right. me, the player, typing, Grace, do you love me? Now, Grace is an artificial intelligence, and she's looking at me really strange because her husband's standing right there and going, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I ask Grace, hey, do you love me? Right. So this is, a, uh, this is an example where you're using artificial intelligence to construct story, to construct a narrative. So it's not a designer writing these lines, but actually the artificial intelligence interpreting the sentence that you type, figuring out an appropriate response. And basically, her husband said, okay, well, this is embarrassing. I'll just leave you guys to it. So he just kind of leaves the room pissed off. <laughs> That's what that is. Okay? So I'm going to go next. All right. Dramatic narrative and lack of interactivity. The narrative structure of computer games is typically constructed according to the conflict-driven model of dramatic narrative. Okay, so dramatic narrative, again, think about Aristotle. It goes all the way back to what exactly is a drama. Um, and a drama has that three part, so beginning, middle, and end, and there's a conflict. So he is saying here that Lily says there that this model, this dramatic narrative, is applied to most computer games, right? So they have the beginning, middle, and end. And he said in the, in the yellow bold part, he says, the story usually is usually not interactive since Act 1, containing the initiating conflict, key scenes within the story of Act 2, and the playing out of the consequences of the final resolution in Act 3, are typically achieved by cut scenes, sequences of conventional, non-interactive video material. Now, I want Kay to rant about cut scenes for a second. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> 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 Cut scenes, not machinima. <laughs> but sometimes, yeah. But sometimes I do have to say they help the story along. Um, I think especially because you know the book club did some things on on World of Warcraft and Warlords of Draenor. I think that that in this latest expansion, it it helped get us over some of the humps of the of the story. 
Um, <laughs> that, that's uh, sometimes they sometimes they do work, but not all the oh. time. <laughs> well, that's so that's so nice. Um, I was gonna, <laughs> you're gonna say ah, because you know there are some problem with cutscenes, and for those of us whose concept is new, you know it's this little sliver of a narrative that when you complete a mission. When you complete, you know, a gameplay, you get a little cut of the the, the story. You go, oh, that's why I'm playing this because I get that story. But sometimes, you know, cutscenes can get really tedious. Sometimes a game developer doesn't let you skip cutscenes, so you have to watch it. So there are some problems with cutscenes. Okay, and uh, I promise you, Lindley is going to criticize this. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll move on from this. He just wanted to explain what a dramatic narrative is, okay? So here's his term, gameplay gestalt. All right. A gameplay gestalt may capture part of the notion of non-semiotic performance within game space identified by Tronstad as a form of action without language-like semiotic coding. So you're making, it's, an, it's, it's a big way of saying, when you're making certain actions in the game, it is not supposed to be recipe sensitive or symbolic or signify anything. Okay, so semiotic encoding, that's what it's talking about there. Um, although the gestalt is more of an interaction pattern involving both the in-game and out-of-game being of the player. So, gestalt psychology, right? It's kind of, back in the day, it was kind of a revolutionary way to examine psychology, which is you have to consider the mental state of the patient as well as the external influence. So you do a syncing of the two. That's what a gestalt is. Okay? So you study what's happening internally and externally. So Lindley kind of took advantage of the word and started to bring it back to where it taught, he uses gish, gameplay gestalt to describe when you have interaction pattern in game and out of game. So I'll explain a little more. Um, a gameplay gestalt, however, is a pattern of perceptual cognitive and motor operations. So he merely locate that only to those three elements. So what you see, what you mentally process, and also your motor uh, operations, right, how you move. It's not only more specific, but could perhaps be measurable in terms of the perceptual cognitive and motor requirements of performing it. So I'm going to move on from that. I, I, I would say, I'd bring Chris in. Chris, so do you think Game Gestalt works with, with Ask Mr. Robot? <laughs> <laughs> and and the other infographic infographic um, styles that that we look at for for after play assessment. Ooh. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was cool. That <laughs> was. I mean, I, I, I will say that infographics is a. Uh, is is a cognitive structure to look at. I think that it does make you look at it different ways, and it's a different way to look at your performance as opposed to experiencing the performance. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm lost in that conversation. But. Okay, well, I, I think it also it, it addresses the idea of flow experience. If we want to get into uh, yeah. Chicks and Mahali, that yeah. um, anything that intrudes into uh, now, I want to back up Sherry's slides. Anyone that <laughs> anything that intrudes into the, the those three systems that help create the experience, which would include mm -hmm. Mr. Robo mm -hmm. infographics. We were playing the other night, and somebody was saying, "I don't like the idea of." my data being publicly accessible by everybody <laughs> you know and it's it's a way of pulling you out of that flow experience of the literary or the gameplay um, and it, it's one of the things that you talk about when you do literary criticism is it, it, if there are elements within the author's craft that has pulled you away from their imagined world it's a bad thing Mm -hmm. Sherry, just, is that kind of the where you were going with that? Um, that idea of Gestalt. Well, not not my idea. This Lindley's idea. Okay. Well, <laughs> well so do you, do you think I'm misinterpreting Lindley? <laughs> no, you're not. No, okay. it just adds to the richness of the conversation. And it's funny. So you know, flow. Yeah, flow is associated with the gameplay Gestalt. He's doing something interesting here. Is for his purposes. 
he created these two terms, gameplay gestalt and narrative gestalt, because he really want people to see there's a difference between them, right? And you guys are right to associate flow with gameplay gestalt. It's it's part of that, you know, the, 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 you're figuring out how to make the flow state happen. And then here's this definition of narrative well, gestalt. Actually, actually, Sherry, oh. I pulled up an example of uh, the Astros to Robot we're talking about. Yeah. The AMR. So if you look at my screen share, you'll see that you know, this is an example of some of the stuff they break out to look at performance. So, you know, there are some of us uh, who like this because it's all quantitative and it lets us know, you know, ranking in comparison to everything else because because we're, you know, a little bit competitive. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, it does add to it. It's you know, the way you guys to think about it would be um, think of, think about this as more like simply an add-on to the game, where it's pulling data from the game and you can look at it. Uh, it's not necessarily available real time though, so I guess that's one of the reasons why it's kind of hard to to place it because it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a real time analysis. You can go back to it. You can you can upload it and pull the information right after a, a fight finishes, but it's not something you can see while you're while you're actually involved in the the actual uh, gameplay. It's it's defining. Hmm. Interesting. And, and uh, that's 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 the thing I would have to I, I have to say, and I was bad asking the question for that. But there is something else. If you want to bring it up, Chris, recount will give you the data so that you are watching the graphics of how well you're doing at the same time. And I think it might be a little bit of a of how do you approach the game? Are you approaching the game to get immersed in the narrative or in the quest? or are you playing the game maybe more a, more as a sport I think hmm. I think that can make it and here's Chris has um, this other thing up and this is one that's called recount now what if he was playing in in you know a group called a you know a, a group called a raid he can pull up um, and get and all these numbers here he can see them moving up and down while he's playing Mm-hmm. And that and that's and that's kind of really you know and that's kind of really funny because when you think about that and when people are playing it are they playing it say as the let's use hero's journey right as the hero who's going into battle against this dragon or are they play you know are they playing it as you know the equivalent of how you'd play baseball instead you know oh I'm I'm playing this as a game player. So th there's some interesting things when you're talking about install. I'm starting to think about, well, you know, how are people playing it, and sure. and what and, and what would what would be you know the narrative gestalt versus the gameplay gestalt. I still think when I'm looking at what you have up here, I'm still thinking there's some people who could be very much still in the nar in the narrative gestalt, and then others who are getting into that gameplay gestalt. Well, he's particularly talking about the design, the design of what you focus on with the gameplay and what you focus on the narrative, but he's not, I don't think he's really saying that you can't be in the narrative while you're outside, because what Chris gave us, that's a perfect example, where it's outside of the game, uh, it's not even real time, which is weird, so... You have the points, so you can look at that, and it's associated with the game. So in a sense, it's, it can be considered as a meta game, right? So it, it's outside of the game, and you're looking through that. So there's a sinking between in and out. But he's not saying that the player's not going to think about the narrative while they're doing that. He is merely talking about two design aesthetics where we're supposed to examine to separate them out. Now, uh, before, I go th uh, before I discuss this slide here, I do have to say I find his theory very interesting, but I also think that he might not... I disagree with his understanding of narrative. <laughs> so let me just go through without telling me, telling you what I think first. But um, here's a little definition, right? He said, a narrative gestalt is a cognitive structure allowing the perception and understanding of unfolding sequence of phenomena as a unified narrative. So he's talking about how cognition, right? So from neuroscience, we know that uh, the brain sinks, and actually from philosophy as well, the, the brain sinks what we see from external world. So phenomena is an event that happened 
in, in the real world. And in order for us to figure out if this is one single event, our brain kind of creates a narrative structure to try to sync those events together. So he is talking about that in terms of he's using the word narrative gestalt to refer to the narrative structure of the mind. Okay, so that's his terminology. And uh, in the context of a computer game, one must learn and then perform a gameplay gestalt in order to progress through the events of the game. To experience the game as a narrative also requires the creation of a narrative gestalt, unifying the game experiences into a coherent narrative structure. So you see, he is saying that we are applying our cognition, right? While we're playing the game, we are applying um, uh, our narrative uh, uh, function to sync those events together to make sense of what it is that we're, that we're looking at. Um, so the tension between gameplay and narrative can now be viewed as a competition between those respective gestalts for perceptual, cognitive, and motor effort. So he's, so again, what is he saying here, right? So there's the gameplay, which is functions that are not semiotic in nature, you know, whatever he means by that, right, the semiotic in nature. And then you have the narrative function, which is our mind trying to understand what it is that we're seeing on the screen, okay? So we're syncing all those information together. Um, and if I sound, if this sounds crazy, first of all, a narrative structure, through neuroscience we know that we impose a narrative structure onto the world that we see. In reality, there is no narrative. Narrative does not exist outside of our mind. We impose it. Right? Philosophy of mind discusses this as well. And just so you know, my training is in philosophy of mind. Okay? So we look at neuroscience as well. And basically what we know is that we do impose a structure onto the world. Because the world is not sequential. The world is the events that happen in the world are not supposed to be interconnected. But as human beings, in order for us to understand our world, our mind create these narrative structures or apply narrative structures to link those events together so somehow these events make sense when the universe is, all, uh, is full of a lot of random events. Okay? So I'm going to go next. Okay, here's this example. So here's this example. Okay, he says, Is it worth trying to jump over a ravine at the risk of falling and having to reload a past game state for the sake of a health pack that may help me to get past the tough enemy ahead without then having to reload and retry when the, uh, the enemy defeats me? The conflict is an ergonomic one within the terms of the gameplay gestalt, and this has nothing to do with a higher level narrative context. So he's saying, like, you know, when you're refreshing a game, it's not as if that is a semiotic uh, uh, meaning that's associated with a narrative context. It's not as if the story of the game is making you refresh the screen. It's merely a techno, uh, technical one or ergonomic one, as he's explaining it. Okay? So next. All right. So here's his big beef. He says, you know, game design, we can't just focus on the gameplay digital, okay? So one of the major problems of game form is the current lack of narrative depth in games. Gameplay gestalts may be highly demanding and therefore highly immersive and talk about the flow, right? We talk about flow and immersive, but tend to be very shallow thematically and performatively repetitive. These are positive value for many game players, frequently leading to addictive playing. There's nevertheless a widespread desire for greater thematic depth even among dedicated gamers. Then he also says, gameplay must be more than repetitive interaction, me uh, interaction mechanism for progressing through a larger scale of fixed and linear narrative structure. So his beef, he's really talking about the dramatic narrative all the way back to Aristotle, which you have the beginning, middle, and end that's linear. So he's calling for a non-linear way of designing, not just focusing on gameplay, but really focusing on how to incorporate narrative into a game. Okay, so next. Okay. Yay, I think you guys might be excited about this one. So, yay, he LARP. started to... <laughs> yay, LARP! So I'll read this a little bit. I know it's a lot of text, but you know, this is what we mean by in-depth, close reading. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with the reader response thing, right? Um, so a LARP, LARP uh, is live action role-playing games, okay? So you're not playing a video game, right? You're playing in person with other people, so that's a LARP. Um, and he calls it an improvis uh, improvisational theater without an audience. So when you're playing, you're taking on the role of somebody, 
you're not doing it for an audience. You are part of the story. So that's what a LARP is supposed to be. And again, it says that for LARPers, what they want is a deep characterization and intensity of emotional experience in character. Okay? So uh, Lindley runs the pur uh, Purgatory Engine project. So when he wrote this paper, he was also talking about his game design company. And he said one of the things that they were concerned about is whether and how it might be possible for players of a computer computer mediated experience to achieve levels of immersion, engagement, and emotional intensity comparable to those of LARPers. So what's exciting is he started studying LARP and he goes, wait a second. How can I put LARP back into computer games? So there's to see the mutual, the analog, and the digital kind of mutually influence each other, right? And another part where I said on the bottom is, his question is, what kind of message can be delivered by players? And by what means such that interaction is fundamentally dramatic and not a repetitive cognitive interaction pattern referred to above as a gameplay gestalt? Now... Hey, Chris, anyone want to talk about LARP? Do you guys have experience with it? Um, yeah, LARP is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, what it is is live action role play. Normally, you come up with your, you come up, and the thing is, we should find some links um, to put up into the, the Hangout, because I think that some of the people under Track 2 might like to, put a little bit of LARPing into their classes as they're going along. Um, mm. Basically, depending depending on how intensive or what you want to go into, um, usually you have a you have some kind of backstory. There is usually event an event. You are usually invited to the event, and this is all face to face. Um, you may or may not be given a character or you may have to develop your own character you have to develop your own costume how specific um, can depend on how serious the group is but if if you want to think in, instead of, you know instead of playing Dungeons and Dragons on a, on a board or on a video think instead if you played the characters and I mean, for any anybody who was a a, the, a drama geek or a theater geek, the, it's it is so different because you don't have to use everyone else's words. You get to develop the character as as a, you know, basically as far as you would like to go ahead and develop that character. It allows for a lot of improvisation. Um, it's cool in the sense that that I came from a dungeon master background. <laughs> and we're, you, you know, so so it was, you know, it, it was then putting, you know, like what would have been, you know, just something that you were reading as, as you were questing along in the for for um, D and D. It was it's taking it into into real play, and and it's just it's really fun. <laughs> that's that's what I can say. <laughs> So, no, uh, Sh like, Sherry, yeah. so one of the things that happened to me, and I'm relatively new to gameplay. Um, well, video gameplay. Uh, last summer, I started reading some of the fiction that particularly Christy Golden has written that parallels the World of Warcraft narrative line. And I, I found that by reading the novels, both my reading was enhanced by my gameplay and the gameplay was enhanced by my reading. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and she she writes a, a good narrative story that kind of explains some of what's going on. Um, I think that now that I look back at it a little more analytically, one of the problems with the actual gameplay is some of the narrative gets disjointed because your attention gets focused on minor objectives. When while in the the novel format, you can really stick with the narrative line. Yeah, perfect. That's a great example where we can kind of see that there is definitely a distinction um, between gameplay and narrative in terms of a story. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're, they're, when he separate gameplay though, yeah, I have some beef about that in terms of what narrativity is because narrative is so complicated that one can argue that when you're doing gameplay, you're constructing a narrative while you're doing a gameplay. So it's like when Kay was saying, you know, earlier when we say if you have for the Book of the Dead, you guys were doing certain uh, uh, enhancements, right, for the environment to to enhance the the plot. So some some scholars 
as well as myself, you know, would argue that when you're doing gameplay, it is a form of narrative. But going back to Leanne's example, you're talking about layer upon layer of narrative, which is what's what's interesting. In some gameplay, though, yeah, because it's one type of narrative, and then there's another layer. Sometimes they don't sync them very well. So th there's that. Uh, yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> There's that disjointedness. And, and Leanne, by the way, just to plug the concept that I was teaching at RG MOOC, right? When you're reading a text, right, while you're playing, what you're doing is you're reading a paratext. And we're going back to Gerard Jeannette, right, the, the, the uh, narrative theorist. A paratext is a type of text which is, you know, an additional text that, that uh, uh, help us interpret the main text. So when you're playing a game and you're reading a novel, what you're actually doing is creating another lens to look at the game. So if you didn't read that text, the game would have been interpreted differently. But through a lens like a paratext, like a novel or something additional, you change the meaning of the text as you are playing. So you're actually creating a whole new different experience by doing that. And, and I would have to say, um, for those of us who did, who, who read The Rise of the Horde before um, the latest expansion in the game, it did make, it, for me, it, it definitely made the gameplay different. It made me pause at certain parts where, where we saw, you know, where we saw characters that we were reading. It, it made me pause when I was going through things I had gone before because suddenly things met. Suddenly, things meant more, and I had a little more understanding of of what was going on there. So for me, it it definitely enriched my experience of going through the expansion, and, and I enjoyed the fact that you know that um, the game was really doing an alternate reality portion of it because they had decided to do a different a different timeline and going back to the past and changing it it was really fun having read what what the main canon of the of the game was and then seeing it along the way i enjoyed it hmm. Very good, very good. See, that's how they kind of mutually influence. You, 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 we're giving us lots of lenses. That's what's fun about, you know, if you understand what the relationships are, they don't really count to each other, but it certainly adds complexity mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the yeah. activity you're doing. All right, let's go next. Yeah. <laughs> if I get too long-winded, you guys just tell me, okay? Um, all right, this last concept by Lindley. He just came up with this concept here. He calls it first-person actor. Okay, so he says in the Zero Game Studio. So he has his own studio. We refer to this evolved drama uh, dramaturgical form as the first-person actor, a new genre of computer game based upon dramatic immersion. So instead of using gameplay to immerse you, right? Instead of using game mechanics, they're talking about using the story, right? Enhanced features of drama uh, dramaturgical interaction in the first person actor may include one, avoidance of computer game staples such as treasure or Easter eggs, weapons, damage, and health. So that's de-emphasized, right? Uh, second thing, a language of interaction that extends basic movement functions currently found in computer games to an extensive repertoire of communicative gestures, expressions, and body language. Keyboard and mouse actions have gained conventional uses for computer games. So, uh, you know, ah, okay, so I won't keep pounding on this idea <laughs> that what he's talking about there, the whole idea about the dramat dramaturgical interaction. Um, again, you're still playing with narrative, it's just narrative behind narrative. But I'm going to stop there, and, and I'm going to move on to, oh, did you, did someone have a comment? Okay, never mind. Um, so if we can go next. Yeah, okay. And I promise we're almost done. <laughs> we had lovely discussions today, so I went a little long, but we're almost done, okay? Uh, another one, Generating Narrative Variation in Interactive Fiction by Nick Montfort. So I know I assign, uh, oh man, three, four books this week. Not that I expect anyone to actually read through the book. I mean, I read through them because I love them, okay? But this is a dissertation written by Nick Monfort, and if you haven't touched this one, I highly recommend that you try to try to play with this particular dissertation. It's one of the better texts where he actually applies narratological principles and computational linguistics to understanding what interactive fictions are doing, okay? 
Now, anyone, please tell me someone played The Walking Dead. I watched The Walking Dead. <laughs> like Let's Play? No, I as in the TV show. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That, that's because my semi-adult children forced me into it. <laughs> oh, come on. That, that's a guilty pleasure. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, this... This particular one is based on the book, so it's not, well, it also has some additional, you know, it kind of took some liberty with the storyline. Um, but what you see here, this is this is where, this is actually a PlayStation version, there's also different versions of it. But you see that the, the game designers were very conscientious in programming four possible narrative uh, uh, option choices using those keypads, right? So you have those four. And depending on what you choose, you might, uh, you know, die a horrible death, or you might be able to escape. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't played this one, I highly, highly, highly recommend The Walking Dead. Uh, if you're not afraid of gore and blood, okay, but it's one of the better current version of an if game, okay. So uh, please go next. Okay. Interactive fiction has transformed into academic text. So here's what Monfort says to us. And I love that he says this. I think the same way because I already apply it in such ways. But he says, at its best, interactive fiction can provide transformative experiences that can help readers understand the world from new perspectives. Right? So when you're playing through the game and you're playing taking on character, just like a LARP game like Kay explained to us earlier, you're taking on personality, you're taking on roles, and you're trying to see the world through their lens. So it makes you a more well-rounded well person by playing if games. Okay? Now the other thing is, he says, interactive fiction is a demanding aesthetic application. It provides a way to disseminate research, research widely, bring ideas about generation into popular consciousness, and have one's work tried and tested by a huge range of users. Now I might take on this challenge. Okay? I might take on this challenge and turn one of my research papers into a giant if game. If anyone's willing to go through the dry, <laughs> 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 the dry text, right? Maybe that's the way to get people to read big papers, you know, because we're yeah. two hundred papers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I love reading. So for me, if you give me a two hundred <laughs> or sixteen hundred, I'll read the whole thing. But I'm thinking, man, you know, maybe. Interactive fiction is the way for future narrative to be consumed, right? So you can go through these options and kind of take on your own and, and add new meaning to the darn thing. So anyway, this is one of the positive things he's saying about if. So we can go next. All right. Okay. Now, uh-oh, here's where you go. Ow, this really hurts. But when you talk about a narrative, you know, there are actually layers inside a narrative. And there is a difference between story versus discourse. So he explains, okay, here's his terminology. The content playing of story has been discussed since Aristotle as mythos, fabula, histoire, and narrative. It is essentially what is told about, okay, what is told about. So what exactly is the content or the event you're trying to talk about. The expression playing of discourse has been framed as logo, sujet, recette, and uh, a narrating, that is, the telling itself. So, what are we saying here? What is, what exactly, what is the topic, or the theme, or the person, or the event you're going to discuss? And the telling itself is exactly how do you do it. So that's the difference between the content playing versus the, uh, uh, the discourse, or the expression playing, okay? And then he says, the idea of what is told about can be considered as distinct from the telling itself. It's not a particularly controversial one. In fact, the idea has been fundamental to narratology. Now, I can't really go into Russian formalism, but next week, I promise you, we will be talking a little bit about Russian formalism and how that is. Yay! Love that Russian formalism. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking Pasiba, about? More Russian formalism. <laughs> Yay! So, you know, I am a big narrative head, you know, and so I see it through that philosophical lens. But anyway, we will cover that next week, so I'm going to move on from here. This is just like a quick introduction, really. Okay, now here's the fun part. Look at how he does this. I absolutely appreciate what he's doing with this computational linguistic. Um, I love linguistics because, you know, grammar is awesome. But 
Look at what he's doing. Okay? Here are the same narrative told twice. Narrative one. John ate a sandwich and then he died. Okay? Beginning, middle, and right? So he died. Narrative two. John died after eating a sandwich. Okay. So we have the same stories, right? But it's told two ways. This is the telling of it, okay, the expression layer. So here's what he says. The basic technique changing the order in which the events in a given temporal sequence are related is important to the aesthetic and the rhetorical effect of more complex narrative and to ones of more literary interest. So rhetoric, you know, is expression and how you persuade, how you use language to persuade others uh, through artistic means to visual means and so forth. So that's what rhetoric means. Even in these examples, many readers will find some higher level differences in these two narratives. Perhaps one provides a wry humor or one suggests causality more strongly, although neither indicates this explicitly. Or one suggests more of a plotting progression and ending of life. Even when the information conveyed is the same, the way it is told is important. This is why he is emphasizing an expression plane, not just a content plane, which is, you know, how the story, uh, what, what exactly is the story about. Okay, so next. Yeah, the second one is more sinister. You're right, Chris. So... <laughs> Maybe the sandwich was the cause. I don't know. <laughs> so, okay, here's this, this thesis, right? So his dissertation, the, t the, the words narrative variation was in the title of his dissertation. So here's how he's going to explain this stuff, okay? What exactly does he mean by that? So he says, the content plan can be seen to have two fundamental elements. So he's breaking it down further, okay? Events, which are things that happen, and existence, which are the entities in the story. So existence, you know, if you go back, talking back to existentialism, there's existence and there's the existentials, but anywhere. But existence are actually things, okay, or entities. Actors, physical objects, and places are all existence. For instance, while any change in the state of these is an event, so any change to them, that's when you call it an event. But actual things, right, that's in the story world, those are existence. An event can be caused by some actor in the story where it may be happening with no agent, such as there was an earthquake. The concept, or this concept, allows the content plan to be understood as being partitioned into, one, a state of all exists in the story world, and two, the changes in that state. So you see there is a difference. So when you write a narrative, it's not just good enough to say, this is what I'm going to write about. But again, how am I going to do it? How am I going to influence those states through the narrative? Those, those are the layers, right? So I'm going to go next. <laughs> oh, funny chats. Okay. So. <laughs> so the next thing. I'm trying to hurry, so I'm sorry. So I'm cutting, cutting a little short. But narrative variation and mood and focalization, okay? So there's another layer. So again, remember I told you that narrative is really complicated? Once I go through just little tidbits, you will want to read his dissertation, okay? So look at this. Of course. He says order. Formalism. <laughs> Yay, yes. <laughs> Besides order, speed, and frequency. So frequency, you know, those three things, order, speed, and frequency, is what we call narrative tense in narratology, okay? In narrative voice, there is more category of variation. So narrative mood, there's another thing, okay? The perspective from which a story is told, also called vocalization, is an important part of mood. The vocalizer of the story determines what information is available to narrate, but does not have to be the I, the narrator. So this is funny. This this term, um, I'm trying to think back to who started this, but I think the, it's not Russian formalist. Um, I'm sorry. When it comes to me, I'll explain it to you. But focalization is that perspective. But when we talk about in a static novel, usually the story is told through a narrator, right? So when we do literary analysis and we tell students to examine point of view, what we're telling the students to do usually is to tell them to examine the story through the narrative point of uh, narrator's point of view. How the narrator's point of view, his context or her context, influence the way we understand the veracity of the events told in the story. Okay, but in this, this is a concept where focalization, which is you can switch between the perspective the, of the characters, but they are not necessarily the narrators. So they might not be telling you the story, but when you switch to them, you can see through their lens what's happening. So this is a, con this is a weird concept, really, okay? Um, 
All right, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go next. On that. We're almost there. We're almost there. So, narrative variation, expression plane. Okay, so we talk about content plane. Here's the expression plane. So he says in narratology, the content plane is properly considered to underline any representation. So any visual. Okay, where it is a text a diagram or set of data structures in a computer program. So a mapping could be reasonably considered the, the software world model to be a form of expression itself. So remember Ian Bogos. I don't know, Kay, Chris, you know, if you guys remember, right, a procedural rhetoric of computer yeah. games, right? Procedural rhetoric, he said computer generated programming is a type of expression, okay? Because it's underlying, right? There's the content layer, and he's talking about the expression layer. Um, an intermediate sort of expression hidden by interactor, but in accessible to certain types of analysis. So interactive fiction produces texts that describe characters and objects, even when these characters and objects are not simulated. That is, when they do not have representation in the world model. So you know what's strange? It's an interactive fiction in the, at least the old sense, you're not really interacting with any of the characters. You just know that the text says, Joe is over there, you know, light a fire. But you don't really know those characters. This is like going back to what Lindley was talking about. He wanted to bring in LARP into computer games because it allows for mul multiple players. It allows for this focalization to change. The current version of interactive fiction is trying to get there, but in the past is when Montfort was writing his dissertation in 2007. Most of it really doesn't have these elements. It's just They're just referencing characters, referencing events, but there's no focalization happening yet. Okay? So next. Okay. All right, here's the last bit. There's the last bit. Here's what he recommends on how we develop a theory of if. And by the way, I think that the possibility is I could not cover his dissertation, obviously. But I would like to bring his dissertation back. So you'll see the text again next week um, for next week's reading. I would like to go a little deeper into what he's talking about because it will help you guys understand what's going on with these games. And also, now you understand it's not so simple to say, well, that's an if game, and that's a story. It's not that simple, right? There's so many things to consider. So he says, to build a theory of interactive fiction that is useful with deeply understanding how interactive fiction is experienced and how better sorts of work can be created, a stronger approach than that of the theory bag is necessary, one which distinguishes those elements of interactive fiction that result from it being, one, a text-accepting, text-generating computer program. Okay. Two, a potential narrative, that is, a system which produces narrative during interaction. Three, a simulation of the environmental world, so that's a narrative architecture that uh, Jenkins talked about, which we can't cover today. Okay. And the fourth is a structure of rules within which an outcome is sought, also known as a game. Now, I might not cover this, but Jesper Jewell you know, particularly argue that interactive fiction can't all can't all be considered games because, and also Nick Monfort, he specifically said certain interactive fiction, it's like CYOA novels, right? Interactive digital novels and whatnot, they don't have win states. A game has to have win states, right? So if it doesn't have a win state, he's arguing, well, it's not really a game. You're just playing Stu and you're trying to understand someone's story, but there's nothing to win. So certain interactive fiction works are not considered game. And Jesper Jewell would like to say that all IFs are not games, right? But as we see the current version, which there's a new terminology now called interactive story, which is you are allowed to interact with other events and other uh, characters in the game, it kind of take if to it, trying to take if to a next level where you can actually do that. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go next. All right. Goodness, I might just do one more slide and that's that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> don't hurt me. We start off late today, but again, you know, I know I talk a long time. Um, <laughs> we interrupted you a lot, too. <laughs> well, you know, it, I love it, okay? We have to talk about this. Otherwise, I feel like I'm talking to myself, so that's awesome, okay? This last one is from Narrating Games to Playable Stories Toward a Poetics of Interactive Narrative, okay, by Marie-Laure Ryan. Isn't it wonderful? 
we just look at computational linguistic and dissecting linguistic. Now we're going to apply Aristotelian poetics to understanding interactive narratives. You see, there are many different ways that game studies allows us to, to dissect the game world. Yeah. So <laughs> this is where I'm going to take us. Now, this game here, I doubt anyone actually played this one or even know. Does anyone know this one? Life is Strange? I do not. No. No. If you search, if you search for it right now, all the gamers, the Let's Players are all playing this particular title, okay? It contains a lot of foul language, though. So if you teach in a K-12 setting, I don't recommend that you use this with your students, okay? But it is a weird, it is a, it's a very unique game in that the mechanic of choice is built into the actual game. So what we mean by that is when you play through this game, you can select your options, and then this girl has a power of traveling back in time, which is, oops, I don't like the consequences of what I just decided, so I'm going to rewind like a tape, rewind my life, and redo the, the narrative option, you know, C or D. But no matter what you decide, here's the tragedy of playing an if game, right? You don't really know what exactly that consequence, the three or four sequences consequence is going to be. You can only see the immediacy of what you're going to do. So if you say, I'm going to take this drink of water, and the next thing is I'm going to use the restroom, that's an immediate event that happens based on that choice. But you don't know really what's going to happen to you in the restroom, whether there's a monster in there or something bad happens in the restroom. You can only see the immediacy of your choice. So that's a really interesting quality and also a tragedy to playing if games. Okay, so I'm going to go next here. Okay, now a unicorn. Yay, holodeck. So Kay knows this text, and, and I think the panel, maybe the rest of you guys have read this one. From, again, the famous book by Janet H. Murray, so Hamlet on the holodeck, right? So Marie Laura Ryan brings back that particular book again and explains why this is a unicorn, okay? So she says, the holodeck is a computer-generated three-dimensional simulation of a fictional world. The user is invited to step into this world to person uh, per impersonate a character and to interact through language and gestures with synthetic computer-created agents. So we're talking back to, you know, the holodeck in Star Trek, right, where the character can walk in and, uh, in fictional world. No matter what the user says or does, the synthetic agents respond coherently and integrate the user's input into a narrative arc that sustains interest. Brenda Laurel calls interactive narrative an elusive unicorn we can imagine but have yet to capture. Because why? It would take an artificial intelligence far beyond the capability of existing systems to be able to process whatever the user decides to do or say in a creativity far beyond the imagination of the best novelists and playwrights to be able to integrate this input into a well-formed plot. Now, let me say this is a controversy from philosophy of mind. So when we study philosophy of mind, we are also concerned with artificial intelligence, okay? And one of the problem is, can artificial intelligence ever really exist? Here's the problem. Artificial intelligence currently does not have context, right? So we have things like chatbots where you're typing, um, yeah, when, when you're typing words into it and the chatbot try to figure out your linguistic context based on the sentence that you wrote, it spit back a response that seems to make sense to that sentence. But here's the problem. The way we operate in the world, we don't just think in linguistics. The way we say things are contextualized by the external world. Artificial intelligence does not have context. It doesn't have access to the outside world. That is why when you look at a text that's generated by artificial intelligence, it looks weird because it doesn't have context. So what they're talking about with this unicorn thing, which is how can you make a game where the AI in an if game, it actually responded to you like a real human being when it can't get outside of the if environment. It doesn't have context to our world. It has only context to the linguistic web, the semantic web that its own programming has generated. Okay? So, I'm going to stop here. I'm more slides, but I'm going to make Chris go all the way to the question slide and, and I, we'll have a quick discussion and see if anyone has a... Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Good old Mario. So, um, I didn't want to go too far, but do you guys have questions or, or, or what do you think about uh, um, some of the texts that we discussed today? 
Well, well, Leanne's already already went and found the life is strange the description of it, and I think we're really going to have to post that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that'll fit really neatly. Again, I keep referring to track two, but like later on in track two, um, Melody found for us an article about about what different parts of game assessment assessment that could happen in games could, are really good. And one of the discussions is of a re, of the ability to rewind. So this is reminding me of your life is strange rewind. And since interactive fiction doesn't doesn't allow you to see what the other um, the other paths could be, what do you think of that, Sherry? Uh, you mean like crossing? Are we supposed mm -hmm. to cross? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, of course. Why not? I mean, we can cross. I mean, we can discuss this. But if you see syncing of the two, that that's great. You know. Because we're both busy on our own tracks, so I haven't seen <laughs> where you guys progress. Because you know, I feel guilty about that. Oh no, but no, again. actually, we're not progressing there till week three. But you're oh, really? here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the, the game here is is interesting because, and again, if our people are are doing their classes according to the multiplayer classroom, you know, yeah. students aren't going to get students aren't going to get a die and do over option there either. Right. 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 So. I know that for so for uh, for us, I mean for for track one, the intention is not not in week two though. We're not playing yet, okay? But in week three, we will be playing several titles. Uh, my intention is to give you guys all the free ones because, like for example, Life is Strange. That's a pay game, and it's very new. Um, it's you know, so it's going to cost a bit of money. But what we want to do is whether there's money or not, there's classic games that you guys can play. Also, I'm a big supporter of the indie game community. So if I can assign indie games by independent developers, um, I would assign them. So week three, the hope is that we are still going to discuss on principles. But I want us to play, whoever gets to play, and then have a nice discussion about the experience. And I know that Trish already started that. But week three is what I hope that we focus understanding theory with playing the games, OK? Now, another thing I want to say, and also, yes, obviously we could do a joint thing if we like, Kay. That would be great. Um, oh, no, no, that's okay. We don't have to. I'm, ju I'm just seeing where, where, it tie where it ties in. Right. Well, well, we can discuss that, too, when we, when we get closer down to it. Um, the other thing is I think, at least I personally think, I think this week's readings are much easier than week two. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I assigned, I thought they were doable because the, the, the writers, even though they're long, okay, I know it's long and it's complex, but they explain their concept very well, okay, so they explain it in these, these, these depths, so I thought, okay, these are easier reading, now we're going to get into the scary nitty gritty stuff, which is this thing called narratology, um, next week, this is the, the second week, right, that's when the text will go, what the heck did you just say? Can you explain that to me again? So I have full intention <laughs> to explain a lot of it, but those terms that I kind of mentioned to you guys, like narrative mood, narrative tense, uh, focalization, right? Those words that that uh, uh, Nick Monfer mentioned, we're going to study those in depth. Okay, so that's that's what uh, week two is. So if you're still with me, it's going to get really exciting or really scary next week. Okay. Okay, well, I can't wait until the third week to start playing these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so either my uh, guildies are going to have to say we're going to all play this game and share our experience, or I'm going to be spending a lot of my time with my son's Xbox. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm crossing my fingers. And also, this the slides today, the presentation, you know, I always, the, the link will be available in a bit. And also, uh, so all the links with the games, you have access to that. Also on the page for we if week one, you know, you guys can see all the links. Actually, I, I put link on all the games already um, on the page. It's okay, just that they're links of words. So if you want to click on some of them, it just takes you directly to them. But I promise you week three, I like to find quirky, quirky games. I don't really like to play with big commercial game titles and K-Gnosis. So... I'm going to give you guys stuff that will trip you out, okay? That's the whole plan for week three, okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, everyone. Thank you, and thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.